Born in London in 86, a stash show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and belts round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting an, and belts round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting episode of Handhelds Around the World. Today, I am in Bucharest, a city where still unreconstructed communism meets unbridled capitalism, where the soporific forces of the European Union meet the passions of the Balkans. Communism once changed the face of this city forever, and nowhere is more evident than that of the gargantuan Palace of Parliament, the craziest tribute to dictatorial megalomania in the history of the modern world. Whilst much of this city is modern and garish, you can also find splendid 17th and 18th century Orthodox churches, and graceful Art Nouveau architecture tucked away in places. This visit has certainly been somewhat of an adventure, so why not today look at Final Fantasy Adventure for the Game Boy? This arguably confusingly named 1991 game, known as Final Fantasy Adventure in North America, was released in Europe as simply Mystic Quest. Due to the fact that us Europeans never got a mainline Final Fantasy game until the release of Final Fantasy VII in 1997, so the Final Fantasy name itself held no gravitas in the region. In Japan, on the other hand, the game was known as Seiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden, which even more confusingly is the prequel to Secret of Mana, more sensibly released as Seiken Densetsu 2 in the Orient. So Final Fantasy Adventure is both a Final Fantasy spin-off and the first entry in the Mana series simultaneously. One of the interesting things about this game is that at the time you either had action RPGs on one end of the spectrum, such as the very obvious choice of The Legend of Zelda, and on the other hand you had traditional RPGs like, well, Final Fantasy, obviously. This is not your traditional RPG, but neither is it your typical adventure game like Zelda. The weapons are more detailed, and the armour and shields can all be upgraded in the traditional RPG way. You navigate your way around the world from an overhead perspective, much like in Zelda. There is a wide range of weapons in the game, which includes the standard broadsword, axes, whips and much more. They even have the staple communist sickle, which is a nice addition. Further to this, certain weapons can be used outside of Battle 2, such as axes can be used to cut down trees to reveal previously inaccessible paths and the whips can be used to chasten your underlings, of course. To be able to access these weapons and items, however, is a little bit fiddlier than in the following upcoming Mana games. There's a lot of button pushing which can feel somewhat cumbersome when you're in the middle of a heated battle, for example. There are over a dozen spells in the game, as is usual in the game of that kind, and again includes your usual restorative and attack spells, Perhaps if you're an even bigger nerd than usual, you could make an all magic party or something. After all, you are a wizard Harry. Whilst I mentioned earlier that this was the prequel to Secret of Mana, being the first Seek and then Setsu game and all, confusingly this is set chronologically after Secret of Mana has taken place in the timeline. So in a way, this is a sequel to Secret of Mana? Prequels, sequels though, it's all nonsense really, it's just the gameplay itself that counts, so let us not overthink all of this too much. We are not all astute weebos who concern ourselves over such trivial matters after all. If you have played both this and Secret of Mana, you will recognise monsters such as the bunnies and the walking mushrooms, game staples which all Mana fans will remember. This game was originally released on the Game Boy, but was re-released by Sunsoft on the Game Boy Color with enhanced graphics. No color though, no no no. You were only allowed to experience this in all its monochromatic glory. 
See, pointless ports were being released on Nintendo platforms, even trying to make fans pay double for the exact same game 20 years ago too. When you boot up the game for the first time, I suppose it starts off a little bit like Pokemon did back in the day. Obviously though, this game does predate Pokemon. You basically start off the game by naming a boy, but I suppose this game is a little more progressive because you get to name a girl too, which is nice. After selecting your characters, you're treated to a Star Wars-esque rolling title screen with a story of what was going on prior to the actual game. It is at this point you are introduced to the story's main antagonist, the Dark Lord, not to be confused with Voldemort. This twat ensures your character is thrown immediately into a courtyard, where he is forced to battle a saber-toothed tiger. After a few swings of your sword, you swiftly defeat the tiger in a battle which would become the staple battle mechanic for the mana games thereafter, like a fine port left to mature over time. However, you can also appreciate just how much this looks like the original Legend of Zelda game as well. Also, just like in Zelda, and the same as was carried into the Mana series, enemies don't just jump and appear randomly like in the typical RPGs. They're visibly on the screen, enabling you the choice in some areas to be able to pick and choose which battles you take part in, and which ones to avoid. The dungeons in the game are more heavily focused on puzzles as opposed to room after room of monstrous obstacles and searching for keys. They are more comparable to the mazes and have things like hidden doors and false walls. Some of the puzzles are very hard, or hard in the sense they are obscure to work out. In a few occasions, you'll have a companion who can accompany you. They can be very beneficial, doing things like all good subjugated servants should do, like heal you or remove poisons, etc. You can also use Ask in the menu, and they can offer you some advice, which is nice. Overworld exploration is more important in this game than in many others. This is particularly important if you want to find all of the available magic. This gives you more reason to search through dungeons and prolongs the length of the game. However, apart from the secret paths you can find with the correct kind of weapon attached, there are no secret caves or hidden entrances which can be discovered with an accurately placed bomb. Which is a shame really, as I like Zelda. When characters level up, you're able to choose which attributes to increase, such as Wisdom, Power, Stamina and Will. This means the characters are much more customizable, which means that, for example, if you're preferable to melee fighters, you can focus more on this. Another great feature is that the game allows you to save more or less wherever you want to, allowing you to pick up from where you were previously. The music in the game is effective for what the game wants to portray. It was composed as a joint effort between Kenji Ito and Nobu Ematsu if I'm pronouncing those right. It feels very atmospheric and a lot of the features of the music carries on into the Mana series after that, which will again be something else that Mana fans would appreciate and probably harp on about so they can sound like they found out some obscure information no one else knows about or something like that. Bloody fanboys. Outside of the trashy Game Boy Color version of the game, Seiken Densetsu received a full remake on the Game Boy Advance, known as Sword of Mana in 2003. This version looks a lot like Secret of Mana from the Super Nintendo, which is a lot more visually pleasing. However, to be honest with you, I have not played through this version yet, so I'm yet to be able to make a full comparison. However, I am sure we can do that in another video down the line. The first Seiken Densetsu game was also ported to the Nintendo Switch in Japan as part of a compilation pack with other Seiken Densetsu games, similar to that of Mario All-Stars. To summarise, I believe Final Fantasy Adventure is a really solid game and should be a definitive entry amongst everybody's library of original Game Boy games. The game is interesting as it has shades of Link's Awakening in terms of gameplay and aesthetics, however there is obviously many elements involved from the Mana series too, being the first entry and all. I would definitely go as far as to saying this is an undersung classic. Thank you for watching today's video, have you got any experience with this game? If so, what are your thoughts on Seiken Densetsu's first outing? 
Which other Game Boy games would you like to see me feature on this channel? Do not forget to like, comment and subscribe as I release new in-depth content just like this every single week. Also, if you're a long-term subscriber, I would like to quickly plug a couple of other online endeavours I have. I now have a secondary YouTube channel known as Top Hat Chat, where myself and a companion discuss and debate everything retro gaming. And I now do Twitch streams too, every Saturday night at 9pm GMT for 6 hours at a time. So come follow us there too at twitch.tv slash tophatchat. That's twitch.tv slash tophatchat. Shout outs to Cole Johnson, Shizuka Kabayashi, Minty Oblivion, Victor Rain, Synth Spaces, Kevin Vahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Atanas Garcia, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Diego Pereira dos Santos Silva, and all of my other patrons. Combined, you will help me find motivation to continue to churn out regular content. If you want to join the YouTube equivalent of the Bullingdon Club, then why not support this channel on Patreon? Yeah! Cheerio!